Myron Chastity, coordinator at People and Planet, and I'll be facilitating our panel this evening. My colleague Eva, who is People and Planet's co-director, will be our tech supporter for this panel. So if you have any tech-related issues, please contact her via the private message function. And Andre, who is the Myron lead at People and Planet, will be supporting us in the chat. If you have any questions for the panelists throughout this event, please write them in the chat and Andre will make sure to write them down. For those who are joining one of the People and Planet events for the first time, People and Planet is the largest student network in the UK, campaigning for social and environmental justice. And this evening, we're incredibly excited about having Gracie Mae Bradley and Dr. Christopher Basaldu with us to speak about the importance of recognizing the connection between migrant and environmental justice. Gracie Mae Bradley is a writer, an abolitionist campaigner, and co-author of Against Borders, The Case for Abolition. She has several years of experience working with, with NGOs and at the grassroots, including as part of Against Borders for the Children and the Black Abolitionist Futures Reading Group. Gracie has recently taken over as Director of Friends of the Earth Scotland, but she's not speaking in that capacity that evening. Gracie, would you like to share anything else about yourself before we start? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. No, I guess I can wave the book around because I use it as a mouse mat. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining. You know, I have, I'm in my third week at Friends of the Earth Scotland. So I would say become a member if you want to know what we're going to do in this area. But right now my thinking is, um, is not institutional. So yeah, I'll leave that there. Thanks. Thank you, Racy. Our second panelist this evening is Dr. Christopher Basaldu. He's a member of the Carissa Comicruda tribe of Texas and volunteers with the South Texas Environmental Justice Network. Dr. Basaldu has worked and lived in the Navajo Nation and se several other uh, native reservations and has served on the faculties of Native American studies, studies at the University of North Dakota and the University of Oklahoma. He has participated in several indigenous movements to resist oil and gas extractive industries, as well as the dehumanizing drive of militarization. Welcome, Christopher. Is there anything about yourself that you'd like to share with us? Um, um, what you just heard is the language of our ancestors. Uh, we call that, we say it's eshtok, and uh, we call ourselves human beings, eshtokna, in our own language, and we call our homelands somisek. And the border between the United States of Mexico and the United States of America actually runs in our in the middle of our homelands. So to us, it's not a border, but to settler colonial nations, it is a border. And that's why I'm just happy to be here and happy that I was invited to, to talk to you and make some comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Such an exciting way to start this panel too. We are very pleased and grateful for having you and Gracie sharing your experiences with us this afternoon. And because I don't want to take more time from the panelists, I'm going to jump right in and ask you, Gracie, why do you think it's important for climate and migrant justice movements in the UK to recognize the intersection between migrant and climate justice? It uh, looks like Gracie may have uh, dropped out. Yeah, I think we 
we lost Gracie. Um, that's okay. <laughs> we we can start maybe with you, Christopher. Would you like to share with us how these intersections play out in the? Oh, is that Gracie coming back? No. Maybe we can go with you, Christopher. <laughs> Would you mind sharing with us how the intersection between migrant and climate justice plays out in your organizing as a member of the Carissa Comer Cruder tribe? Um, first of all, um, like I said in, in my introduction, the border is not, it's not real. It's not real in sort of some sort of spiritual sense. It's a border the border exists because of very long history of violence, of multiple forms of violence that continue to this day. It's not like violence has stopped. The violence of colonization of these lands, which has included systematic genocide of native and indigenous people, their dispossession, their incarceration, their, you know, they're basically their denial, being denied by foreign powers access to their own homelands and the ability to live within their own homelands that they lived for thousands and thousands of years. And there are many, many Native American nations along the so-called border between the United States of America and the United States of Mexico. And so there's a shared perspective that this boundary is imposed, it's new, uh, it's fake in the sense that it's this, there's no real line there, but it's a line that is created and it has a physical reality in the sense that it has to be maintained through violence, structural violences, legal violences, the violence of law enforcement and even the violence of military intervention. And that in and of itself has to be where we start our analysis from, is that here it's, it's stolen land. And in order to seal that land, settlers and settler governments have literally murdered people. Starting from that perspective, the next connection we have to make is that migrating is simply human. So people moving across lands in order to survive or seek a better life, this is just normal. Oh, Gracie's back, thank goodness. Uh, uh, that migrating across lands is simply human, right? And so again, there's the imposition of violence, and in this case over here by settler colonists, in order to create uh, or maintain a fiction of a boundary that doesn't mean that the violence is against actual human beings, human lives, human bodies, human families is not there. Okay, and now the, the, the final connection, the third connection of those two points is that human beings, especially from an indigenous perspective, are not separate or different from the environment. If an environment is destroyed or degraded, human beings must move in order to survive. And what we're seeing is migration of human beings because either global capital has destroyed their lands or extracted their resources against their will, against the will of the people, against the will of indigenous people. And that violence causes people to move. As the coastlines, you know, they keep telling us sea level is going to rise. And so coastlines will be more and more inundated by seawaters then people are gonna to have to move away from those coasts. Um, and it's usually the poorest people who have the least access to capital and the least access to wealth or resources that lose everything. They literally walk and migrate with just the clothes on their backs if they're lucky. And many times even without documentation. And so migrant justice and climate justice go hand in hand because if we actually had climate justice we wouldn't have the violent displacement of people they wouldn't be forced to move and then you have this double tragedy of settler colonial nation states empowering so-called law enforcement for these fictitious laws 
to sort of sanctify and give them impunity on the violence that they're doing to people, to human beings. And it's literally bound up, fourth point, it's literally bound up in 500 years of genocidal history that makes white Americans, white Canadians, white Mexicans who are in the ruling class and ruling power who have no pain, but have all this power to inflict violence on people with no power to resist that violence, you know, other than their stories. So all of these issues are already connected because it's been connected by 500 years of global colonization and genocide in the theft of resources to create a white supremacist global system where Europe becomes so incredibly wealthy and you know European Americans, European Canadians, European Mexicans become incredibly wealthy and a ruling class and who have no human emotion about the lives and land that they destroy. Sorry if that was too long-winded, but I'm glad Gracie's back. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher, for sharing such insightful comments. And thank you for mentioning also how the law plays out to create those imaginary borders. So many injustices have been committed against racialized people, especially um, indigenous people through colonialism. That it's really difficult emotionally to listen to them. But at the same time, it reminds me of the powerful words of the daughter of Jacinta Marcial, an autonomy indigenous woman in Mexico, who was unfairly sentenced to prison because of her race. And Jacinta's daughter gave a moving discourse when she was liberated after three years. And without knowing, she created a slogan that now we use throughout Latin America. And she said, we're standing in the fight for our lands, for our life, for humanity, until dignity becomes the norm. So let's hope that dignity becomes the new norm soon. Um, Gracie, we're happy to have you back here. Uh, just before we, we lost you, <laughs> uh, I was asking you if you'd mind um, sharing with us what you think it's important for the UK movements of climate and migrant justice to recognize the intersection between climate and migrant justice. Over to you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me and uh, my internet who wants to sabotage me. Um, I think I'm probably going to reiterate some of the things that Christopher just said, at least those bits that I caught. Um, I found it quite difficult actually to to pass an answer that was clear, because for me, these two migrant justice and climate justice really are not very, they're not really separated at all in my head, conceptually. So it was quite interesting trying to tease those threads out. Um, and I suppose I'd start by saying that, you know, we often talk about the climate crisis and the migrant crisis. And I think that those labels are obviously misleading because they imply that, you know, the climate is the problem, migrants are the problem, climate and migrants are, are the cause or the substance of the crises. And what we know is that forced migration and ecological collapse aren't mysterious natural disasters or, you know, the ordinary state of things, they're the consequences of racial capitalism. Um, and I think it's really important for movements in the UK to understand racial capitalism as a foundation, because this is why these crises are mutually reinforcing. They have a shared foundation. Um, so one, you have people who are forced to move because of ecological collapse and who find it difficult to move because of existing punitive immigration systems, right? So climate crisis is producing migrants and existing borders are making their lives harder. And at the same time, government in the global north in particular are responding to and will respond to ecological collapse through bordering and militarization by ratcheting those things up. They'll, and that will make it harder for people to move for any reason, climate related or not. And so bordering is a response to the climate crisis that affects and will affect people on the move. So I think we should understand these things as constituting one another. I also wanted to bring in the fact that immigration systems in the global north 
often grant only partial rights or limited rights to migrants and their descendants. So where there are environmental issues in the global north, it's disproportionately migrants in those places and people minoritized in other ways who are affected. Um, so in the UK, we have right to rent legislation, which makes it harder for migrants and people of color to find good quality housing. And there are also restrictions on what kinds of work migrants can do and how their qualifications are recognized. And that means that people end up poorer. They end up in lower quality housing that's far less likely to have access to green space, more likely to be near incinerators, more likely to be near airports or highly polluting roads. So these are dynamics between environment and migration that reinforce one another within countries. It's not simply an international dynamic. Um, but on the question of justice, climate justice and migrant justice, you know, I think these things make overlapping demands of us and of the world. And they both require radical action to ensure the freedom and flourishing of people at the sharpest end of bordering and ecological collapse. You know, they both require system change, not tinkering at the edges. Um, they require reducing the role of the police and militaries, uh, ensuring that economic systems give people the means to live rather than producing an excess of objects and waste and insecure work. They require us to prioritize technological innovations that support people living good lives where they are or moving somewhere else rather than technologies that focus on containment and caging people. And I guess from an abolitionist perspective, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore would tell us, the system change means presence and not absence. So it's not just about getting rid of fossil fuels or getting rid of borders. It's about practicing and building towards those ways of living, those relationships, those goods and essential services that all of us need to flourish. Um, that was where I got to. Thank you very much, Gracie. Um, I'm sure lots of people have questions about what Gracie just said, and it'd be great if you can write them in the chat so we can make sure uh, Gracie and Christopher can answer your questions later. Uh, but before that, before we open the space to questions, um, just about what Gracie was saying about the importance of building those um, steps to go towards uh, a world without borders and challenging the system. Uh, we have at People on Planet our Divest Borders campaign where students are trying to challenge uh, not only the the, the the system as at the like state level, but also at the level of companies. So they are trying to challenge the social license of the companies, such as a Circle or Accenture, that are making sure that violence can keep being perpetuated and that we can live in a militarized world and borders, but also they are sur surveilling racialized people. Uh, but all of this is happening, as Racy mentioned, in a context where we have Western governments sustaining and reproducing the narrative of like borders as a way of mitigating climate change. So I think it'd be super interesting to hear from you, Christopher. What do you think we can do to ensure that our local actions and campaigning for migrant and climate justice, for example, as students at UK universities, transcends borders and is rooted in solidarity with those at the front lines of injustice, at the same time as we like try to challenge these narratives about like borders as a way of mitigating climate change? Oh, wow, that is a really tough question. Um, so first, uh, I, I just want to sort of elaborate a little bit on how militarized enforcement of borders is one, a bad strategy, but it's a strategy for climate mitigation. And briefly, um, the United States of America as a settler colonial state, uh, you know, set up what's known as the Border Patrol back in the 1920s, the early 1920s. And the Border Patrol was literally a police 
force along the southern border to, to police race, creating a category of race and trying to keep America white and to make sure that brown people that came up from the south or brown and black people that came up from the south were disallowed to exist in the United States. Um, that, that history just sort of puts it in, in perspective that our law enforcement and border uh, enforcement from its inception is racist and that it's racializing human beings so that they don't enter their, this imagined America, United States of America, that is uh, an ethno state, a white ethno state that is equated to climate mitigation in that you have had in the past uh, you know, several decades, especially since the, the tragedy of 9-11, what you've had is the United States responding by saying, we have to keep our, the, the body of the United States pure of both terrorism and non-whiteness. And so the United States created this sort of like meta narrative that everything that is not white is therefore a potential terrorist threat. And they used that idea to cement uh, sort of popular approval of, of hardening the border, making it, making more border barrier into border walls, higher walls, stronger walls, more walls, right? And at the same time, uh, you know, transmitting this notion that people coming up to the southern border of the United States of America are terrorists rather than fleeing ecological collapse or rather than fleeing violence that the United States foreign policy has created. Why? They create this, for, this violence in so-called Latin America in order to clear the land so that resources can be extracted or labor can be extracted. So as ecological collapse or as violence causes land to not be in relationship with the people that live on it, because human beings are not separate from the environment, human beings must exist in relationship with the environment. Of course, you know, the global north is in a very abusive relationship with the environment and an abusive relationship with nature. But in, in, I mean, this is a really long-winded answer with the United States is, the United States has, has poured billions of dollars into a climate mitigation strategy that is simply, we are going to build a wall so that climate migrants will not be able to come into the United States and take away our good stuff. Not gonna take away our housing, not gonna take away our jobs, not gonna take away our peace of mind. Um, the United States of America has chosen badly, has chosen wrongly, has chosen inhumanely, but that's on brand for the real history of the United States, which is genocidal. Always has been and has never ceased to be genocidal. Their response to climate mitigation is to create Fortress America and then market the sort of like green capitalism and this notion that America is going to be a green utopia, sadly. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Christopher. No, I think what you were saying about how it's being created through the neoliberal politics applied in the majority of the world and then forcing people who are connected and have like an ontology that connects them with more than humans or nature to migrate to the global north to be exploited and keep extracting from them is such like a wise like standpoint that it's it's really hard to listen but uh, but it's also like empowering maybe I don't know if that's the right word to, to speak about empowerment. But anyway, um, before I continue speaking, uh, thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, 
Gracie, I don't know if you'd like to share with us a little bit more about from your experience, what do you think uh, we can do to take action locally and connect the migrant and climate movements globally while resisting these narratives? Um, so I have a few thoughts. One thought is around messaging, that there's a lot of room for joined up thinking about actually how we articulate these issues. Um, I think there's a really big opportunity for activists in the global north to foreground the priorities and demands of activists in the global south and minoritized communities within the global north. And I think in particular, the climate movement needs to avoid using arguments around overpopulation and mass migration. You know, even kind of progressive, benevolent climate people do this, um, you know, these terms are used as bogeymen to try and scare governments into climate action and to maybe try and rouse, I don't know, the chattering classes into thinking that climate stuff is important. Um, but obviously these terms play into racist tropes and anxieties around there being too many of a certain kind of person. And of course, these terms ignore the fact that the climate crisis has its roots, as we've both said, in settler colonialism and is the result of an extremely wealthy minority of predominantly white people and corporations hoarding and exploiting resources in ways that disproportionately harm the global south. So I think there's it's not that I think people need to do debunking because I think debunking can often just reinforce um, the same terms. But I think avoiding and within our own movement spaces explaining this is why we don't go on about overpopulation. This is why we don't do stuff on mass migration. I think that would be one thing that people can do. Um, but I also think, you know, I think capacity is so stretched, but where migrant justice activists can support climate actions, that's great, especially when they're at the local level. So, you know, that might be people campaigning and lobbying at the neighborhood level for, you know, low emission zones and better public transport and cycle infrastructure or better recycling facilities or reclaiming green spaces for food growing like everybody should understand that actually those things are yes to do with environmental justice but they're also to do with migrant justice so I would say showing up when people are militating for those things is um is important and I think finally we need to recognize that uh, yes, our legal frameworks produce some of the injustices that we want to mitigate. At the same time, they are a, a limited tool in pr protecting against some of these phenomena. So, you know, the Global North really is on a mission to dismantle refugee laws. It's also undermining massively protections for free expression, people's ability to go out and protest. And I think that we need not only to be defensive and say, no, you can't take those things away from us, but we also need to think, what's the future of this kind of legal protection? I don't think movements should let the majority of their energy be consumed by legislative reform. But at the same time, in terms of kind of concrete demands to governments right now, we could be saying, well, actually, we want we want a stronger refugee convention. We want a refugee convention that explicitly mentions climate. You know, these are reformist demands, but these will be the outer limit of what some groups can say. Other groups can do more radical, interesting stuff. But those groups that are working within that legislative parliamentary lobbying agenda have a think about these things, because actually governments everywhere are becoming increasingly authoritarian when it comes not just to people on the move but also to the right to protest amazing thank you very much Gracie uh I think recognizing the law as this this symbolically powerful tool is important but as you said all our efforts shouldn't be like focused on that because law by the end is another colonial tool and as Audrey already said it, um, the master's tool will, tools will never dismantle the, the master's house. And I think that's that's what happens with, Lou, with law all the time. Uh, th but thank you very much, Gracie, for sharing some of your wisdom. I uh, will give a space to people to ask questions in a minute. 
But since I have the privilege of chairing, and because the Migrant Justice team is so excited about this panel, I hope you don't mind it's going to be me who is going to ask the first question on behalf of the Diverse Borders crew. Uh, because at Diverse Borders and our student organizers are very aware that campaigning and organizing can take a lot of energy from individuals and networks resisting injustices, meaning that a lot of times we can feel disconnected or overwhelmed. So we'd love to hear from both of you, how do you think we can create organizing spaces where people take care of and connect with themselves, their bodies and each other? Christopher, over to you. Wow, another, another tough question. Um, This is something that I struggle with, and uh, some of the other people in the South Texas Environmental Justice Network, we're struggling with this right now because we've we've had so many bad things happen in our direction. Uh, our community is is you know the, this part of Texas is some of the poorest counties in the United States. Um, they are ramping up uh, law enforcement to harass and stop people from protesting or having access to protests. Um, this, this is very draining on, on us. And then on top of that, uh, in the United States, because of labor exploitation, nobody really in the United States has secure job prospects. So, uh, employers can usually fire their employees just for nothing. And of course, racism is real in the United States. And so people are, are losing their jobs because of racism. Um, so it's, it's like, we don't, it's very difficult for us to even survive in the racial capital, the, the racial, the racist capital of the world, the United States of America. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, I wish I knew, I mean, um, a lot of this kind of work is burnout and I don't have any extra advice other than the usual, you know, support each other, keep an eye on each other, making, making sure that when people are, are hurting or close to burnout that they find ways to support each other, but then also understanding that that's also what's spreading us so thin. I mean, we have to survive while we're taking care of ourselves, while we're taking care of each other. And you know, when you think about it, when you're doing community work with each other, that is also the work of the movement. We can't think that the work of the movement is only protesting, it's not only lobbying, it's not only taking a risk. The work of the movement is building our interconnected humanity because what racial capitalism has done globally is it's stripped racialized people of their humanity. When it comes to indigenous people ripping people from the land, their own homeland, that is inhumane. It's tearing apart what it means to be truly human, uh, you know, to create the neoliberal individual subject, right? The neoliberal individual subject is not fully human. You know, they are an exploited sort of person that's being forced to be cogs in the wheels, very mechanistic but actually maintaining community with one another and keeping trust with one another, yeah, it's a lot of energy and it's a lot of hard work, but it shouldn't be seen as something other than the movement. And when it comes to native and indigenous people like ourselves, you know, when, when we take time for our ceremonies, when we take time for our, the ceremonies that have been you know, on this land for millennia, that we, we don't see our ceremonies as when we come together for ceremony, we're not doing it because, oh, we've got to resist the white man and colonization, border militarization. We're doing it because this is what we've done and what our ancestors have done for thousands upon thousands of thousands of years. Outside of the context of that ceremony, the fact that natives are still having ceremony and are still living in community together is resistance to settler colonialism and the environmental collapse that it's causing and cap uh, 
capitalism. It's, it's resistance to all of that because it's a form of living humanity that we're trying to, to make sure moves on to future generations. Again, because what we think of as capitalism, uh, environmental destruction through capitalism, all of these things is the stripping away of humanity and the impunity that families like, you know, the Windsors can just sleep on their wealth and be happy about, <laughs> about all the destruction that they've caused and that they've been, they've been uh, you know, encouraging for so long. It's, it's not separate. It's like, we're trying to be human and remain human and not this other type of humanity that's exploitative and destruction, destructive. We're trying to live in community where human beings are not separate from the earth, that human community can live in responsible, caring relationships with our environments and the other non-human relatives that we have. So when native people do participate in those kind of ceremonies, many native ceremonies are simply about giving thanks to our non-native, our non-human relatives that make our lives possible, you know, make our humanity possible. And to be fully human is to recognize those responsibilities and that giving of thanks to our relatives that we connected, live together in this net of life. And uh, capitalism is what's constantly breaking the threads of that web. Thank you very much, Christopher. It reminded me of an experience I had um, when visiting an agroecological network of peasants who are my teachers really now. And there was a woman who, who had spent all her money taking apples to the city and she didn't make any money. She lost all her money, just paying the bus. And when I asked, why do you do that if you're not getting money from this and you're coming to, to the market to sell this? And she replied to me, because the apples are part of the earth of the Pachamama. And if I if I just waste them, then I'm I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting the Pachamama, the earth. And there are so many things we need to relearn and unlearn, of course. But of course, there is also like this idea of romanticizing, creating networks while people are trying to survive. I don't know, uh, Gracie, if you'd like to add anything else to to the, to the question I just asked to, to Christopher and you about how we can create these spaces while also trying or stopping romanticizing the creation of these organizing spaces? Sure. Um, yeah, I had some maybe uh, like relatively prosaic thoughts on this. I think just to echo Christopher, first of all, that, you know, like one burned out person is not going to save the world we can't think of ourselves in that way it just doesn't it doesn't work it's not going to serve us right um so I think we need to just let ourselves slow down and take the long view take a view across generations and recognize that not everyone has to do everything it's not possible it's not desirable um you know I say this as somebody who you know got eaten alive by a very big job and then spent years saying okay right what do I want my life to be you know that's really important um I think it's important that we learn how to deal with harm in our movement spaces I think that that's I think people are well on board with the bits of abolition that are kind of redistributive where we're saying less for the police more for healthcare. And people are maybe less on board or have thought a bit less about, OK, but also if we don't want any police, I mean, the police don't deal with harm anyway. We need to figure out how to deal with harm. That actually means practicing that, um, you know, that's we can read about it. Sure. But we're just going to have to practice and experiment and make mistakes and keep learning. So I think learning how to deal with harm in our movement spaces is really important because so many just kind of implode because things can't be held and worked through. Um, really practical notes, I'd say it's important to have child-friendly meetings and spaces. Um, 
it's important where we can to maintain some of those pandemic protections. So can we provide masks? Can we provide lateral flow tests? Can we tell people what ventilation there's going to be? Can we meet outside? Can we do hybrid meetings? Um, so there's some pragmatic stuff from there. I think also, though, it's again to echo Christopher, it's not as if utopia is a fixed destination somewhere in the distance, right? Is something that we have to practice in the here and now. So there has to be room for joy. And, you know, I reveal myself here, different things bring different people joy. But for me, that would be eating stuff. It would be swimming around. It would be being under a tree, might be singing together, It'd probably be being on quite a long walk. You know, there has to be room for that in our lives and in our movement spaces. Because when I think about the things that have brought me loads of joy in doing movement work a, a lot of it has been you know it's been out on the demo but it's been because I ran into like a million of my friends and I hadn't seen them for ages and you know we're all there chanting together and we're all together in this big crowd and you know there's got to be space for that it can't just be it can't be miserable um so yeah that those would be my reflections on that point Thank you very much, Tracy. So true, we need to reconnect with ourselves and have that connection with nature more than humans and each other. Create room for that is certainly one of like the first revolutions we can start to do now. Thank you very much, Gracie and Christopher. It's really, it's been really inspiring to listen to you and from your experiences. And I'm sure there's much more that we can explore in the next 15 minutes. So if we can now open the space for the awesome people joining us today um, to ask any questions or share any thoughts or comments that you might have. Uh, I don't know, Andre, if we have any questions in the chat. I think you're muted, Andre. Sorry, just gonna unmute. Um, yeah, we got some. Yeah, we got two two great questions in, and probably for the interest of time, maybe I'll direct one at Christopher and one at Gracie, and then we can yeah, uh, hopefully fit it in. So, Christopher, we got a question from Stephanie, who says uh, she's been thinking a lot about who our laws, policies, government leaders are really working for in the relationship to human rights. She'd love to hear more on uh, what your views are in relation to using the framework of genocide to discuss climate and migrant injustice and its impact on people at present. Is there another framework? What's the best way to create understanding when you're speaking to someone coming from a very different point of view or in a position of power? Um, so a couple of parts to that, but yeah, jump in on, on it. any of that that takes your interest. Uh, that's a lot. Um... As far as like lawmakers and governments, they do not work for the people. It is simply ideological pablum that, that says, oh, we represent the people, we're for the people, by the people. It has nothing to do with the people. But then we also need to know what is the meta narrative of saying who are the people that they're for. Uh, again, the United States denies that it's a white supremacist ethno state. But when you look at the cumulative effect of injustice in the United States, you, you, it's clear that the United States is constantly internally at war with black and brown people. Uh, it's continuing to genocide native people and, and destroy their lands and destroy their sacred sites, take their resources, exploit their labor. Um, there has been no attempt of the United States government to ever give any reparations towards enslaved Africans. Uh, formerly enslaved people. Uh, I constantly, in my education of other fellow United States citizens, I have to remind them that Native and Indigenous people were also enslaved by the Spanish, by the British. Um, you know, these are the histories that built up the United States. And so none of these governments are representing the people. And if they're representing anybody, they're representing the ruling class. And that's just that's, that's simple. I don't even feel like arguing that with anyone anymore. I'm too old to argue that anymore. And so our ruling classes serve their interests and our ruling classes interests are those interests of capital. So the ruling classes and capital must be overthrown because they are one and the same thing. Uh, and as far as like 
all workers, we need to continue educating workers that, you know, if they're middle management or management, they're still workers because the moment they lose their managerial job, they don't have, you know, capital or wealth to fall back on. Um, as far as like the framework of genocide, I don't see, I mean, I can describe using the framework of genocide in our mu movement as a strategy, but as a native person, it's not simply a strategy, it's simply the truth. And I think, I, I, I think that uh, it's difficult to even think about what strategy can be. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in part of meetings where we're trying to tell banks to divest from extractive like oil and gas projects here where I live. And they get, these bank officials, you know, European bank officials, they get so upset and they get mad at me. Well, why are you calling me a uh, somebody who commits genocide? You don't know my ancestors. I haven't committed any crimes against humanity. And I, I'm so exhausted that I have to tell them I'm talking about the structures of history that are, you know, indisputable. I'm not talking about personally telling a bank official or a minister of parliament that they are a genocider. I'm saying, you know, this is the this is the history of where we got here. And if you promote your bank to invest in an extractive plant or, or export terminal, gas export terminal, if your insurance company is insuring that project, you are participating in this history of genocide and extraction that is still to this day causing the deaths of non-rich white people in Europe. Uh, and it's it's very difficult, but I, I don't, me personally, I just don't see it as a strategy. I just see it as the truth. So I guess our, our next question is how do we strategize the truth <laughs> to work for us? Uh, yeah, that, that that's a good question I'm gonna sit with today. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, I think we also have a question for Gracie. Okay, Gracie, uh, how should border abolitionists engage with the question of Scottish independence, particularly those organizing in Scotland? Interesting question. Really not something I had directed my mind to ever. Um, I, I mean, I think about the Brexit question and I think about the failure of many to appreciate what that project was materially, which was ultimately about taking a set of rights away from people and trying to dismantle a legal framework that was insufficient, but provided more protections than if it wasn't there in terms of environment and data protection and so on. So I think people, you know, I remember going to round tables with constitutional scholars who would be like, this is about turning the British constitution back to pre-1980 or 70, whatever, it's about sovereignty, it's about blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was really actually about, yeah, stripping people of rights um, and hanging loads of dog whistles off the arguments that came with that. So I would want to, you know, I think we have to look materially at what Scottish independence actually entails. Um, and I guess I just, you can just make all kinds of promises before you become independent, right? I think that's the reality in the course, in the run up to a referendum, you can make whatever promises you want. Some people might want to leverage that to, you know, say that an independent Scotland would be nuclear free or would conclude bilateral ecological displacement agreements or whatever. Some people might want to use a, an independence campaign in that way my question would be okay well what's your strategy for when the government has said some really progressive thing and then doesn't do it because it doesn't need to because it got what it got what it wanted like those would be my strategic questions I think I think I would also ask whether that is a kind of priority site of struggle for people organizing and campaigning in Scotland I would ask what is the opportunity cost of you know, mobilizing massively for an independent for an independence referendum versus the work that people are already doing. I think that that's 
again, something we rubbed up against in the kind of Jeremy Corbyn years of the Labour Party. It was like, okay, all of this energy is going to go into the Labour Party, who are also ignoring, even under Corbyn's leadership, ignoring a lot of really brilliant grassroots campaigns because they have to hunker down because they're trying to get into power. And in the meantime, you know, there's uh, anti-raids groups, there are street kitchens, there are all these other initiatives that don't have people involved in them because everybody's doing Labour stuff. But it's not that mechanistic because actually there are loads of people who are radicalised in that moment who, after that leadership collapse, didn't have anywhere else to go. But so much political education had been done by organisations like Momentum, etc., that then there was this flow of activity back into this grassroots stuff. So... You know, it's not as if I think it's all preordained and I'm not particularly cynical about what people do or don't get involved in. I think my question would just be, what is your strategy and what's your strategy when invariably politicians don't do what they say they're going to do? And what are you going to get pulled out of if you get involved in this? Those are the questions that I would be asking people and that I think people should ask themselves. Thank you very much, Racy. I don't know if there is anyone else who has any questions. You can either write a one in the chat if you want to ask them unmuted. Eva, maybe we can enable the function for everyone. So if anyone has any questions, just please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I'll probably give people one minute so they they are not shy uh but yeah it'd be great to and andre yeah i was gonna ask um just because i'm so uh invigorated by this conversation if there was one resource you might direct me to uh to go and look at after this whether it's a film a poem a, a article something um anything to to continue thinking about this afterwards what would you what would you send me to i would send you directly to if you're if you're privileged and honored enough to still have your grandmother great grandmother alive i'd say the first thing is go to them and hear their story because even if you're not asking them direct questions like we're directing in this panel because this panel sort of has framed what questions are going to come up through the topics but um, you'd be surprised what you can learn from your ancestors living uh, and what they remember from their ancestors when they were living. You know, go ask them and see what insights that gives you on the struggles that we're in the middle of now. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, yeah, I remember I used to go to school and we used to learn about Christianity and I used to go back home and my mom would be like speaking about the Pachamama and the Cañaris. And I used to think, oh my God, we're too modern for this. And now I realize after 28 years or 25 years, I realized how important it was to go and listen back to her. And Gracie, would you like to add anything else? Um, I, I mean, one of the things that Luke and I did in the book that was really challenging or our editor set us this challenge of basically saying can you like describe a borderless world sketch sketch it out say something about what it's actually like or what it will actually be like and this is something that we just left <laughs> we like wrote loads of other parts of the book and this was just this hanging thing um and then one day I was procrastinating and I thought you know what let me try and answer this question let me write a little bit of fiction um which is what became the interludes in the book and so I suppose I had actually okay for, I'll give a reading recommendation for those who aren't into writing but I would say you know give yourself 500 words to 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 sketch out you know some future or some bit of the present um that looks like the world that you want to live in give yourself that space um and if you don't want to do any writing go and read women on the edge of time by marge piercy just do something imaginative right that's that's what i would invite us to do thank you very much racy we have three minutes left if someone else wants to ask a question but otherwise i don't know race or christopher if you want to ask a question to each other Uh, I don't have a question, Gracie, but I do want to say I'm very happy to 
meet you and honored to listen to you. And hopefully we'll still have conversations in the future. I mean, feel free to email me or contact me anytime or we can exchange numbers off, off camera at some other point too. I would love to do that. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know, may, you can say something about this now if you want to, or we can take it onto email, but I guess I'm, maybe it gets a little bit to this question about Scottish independence, but what we were talking about earlier, how do you think that demands for land back interact with border abolition? Um, yeah, just as I say, that's something that people have asked Luke and I, and we have our own, we come from a particular place. And when we answer those questions, then I'm really interested in your view. Well, in this case, I can't speak, I cannot speak for all native cultures, native nations, for, but for myself, I think land back is the foundation of justice in the Western hemisphere. I mean, all these European nation states, European governance, European forms of law uh, just need to vanish. Um, and then we can start over with, you know, the land, land back. I mean, the land, it, it's not like native people have this notion that, that native people own the land in fee simple title. That's a European, the, the, the ideologies and violence of private property were imposed on living systems of inter, interrelated relationships between various different native polities within their own environment, right? Uh, so how are we going to, if you wanna call it solve the climate crisis, well, we have to recognize that the climate crisis is created by the exploitation and destruction of land through capital and the control of land is the violence that's going to keep capitalism moving so if we just if that control is gone and land back is you know back to native nations then there's there's something to build with you know build a new form of relations uh modes of production even that aren't based on theft and exploitation. But the thing is, it's, it is going to look different for Europe than it will for the Western Hemisphere, uh, because all of these native nations, native people, they have literally thousands of years of history of existing within their homelands, respectively, because it's not one unified nation. And you have the interruption of those histories 500 years ago. In, in human history, 500 years is, is not that long ago. So, you know, land back is the starting point. And then we can ask different questions like, how are we going to reestablish respectful relationships in every indigenous community that's surviving? How do we revive those indigenous communities that used to be here, but were erased, destroyed, or, or just murdered? How do we reestablish human beings living in community with each other and their environs and the land in ways that are not destructive. Thank you, Christopher. And thank you everyone for your questions. And uh, thank you again, Christopher and Gracie for being here with us today. On behalf of People on Planet, I also want to express our gratitude to the people who are joining us today in this panel because it's just people like you uh, campaigning for a world where dignity becomes the norm that gives such a strength to the to the movements for justice and before we close the space i'd like to invite gracie and christopher one last time to share any final thoughts or comments that you might have uh, so yeah grace is over to you it's just been an absolute joy to share the space with you, Christopher, and thank you to folk at People and Planet for, for convening us. Yeah, that's all I have to say. What a nice way to spend an evening. Thank you, Racy. Christopher. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here, and thank you for listening. Um, in, in our language, my language, my ancestral language, we say, I am up by when we depart from each other. I am a bias cell. It literally means give life. Um, 
and and you know the the, the structures the global structures we've been talking about are structures that give death <laughs> so this ancient you know our ancient parting greeting I am a biofell, you know, give life. It's it's taken on a whole new meaning now in the 21st century, you know, that our ancestors are always, you know, when we leave each other, we were always encouraging each other to do, make the choices and be living in such a way that we're giving life and not giving destruction. So I am a biofell. Thank you, Christopher, and I am a payasa. And thanks everyone again for this hour of reflection, organizing towards dignity and justice. Don't forget we got our Diverse Borders workshop at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Eva is gonna share the registration link in the chat. And on Friday, we have our amazing organizers leading a day of action across the UK universities. Have a lovely evening, everyone. I am a payasa. Bye-bye.